Let's begin to look at the four chambers of the heart. You'll notice this drawing is color-coded to represent the two types of blood. Blue is going to be representing the deoxygenated blood flow. Red represents oxygenated blood. You'll notice that the heart separates these two types of blood. The left side of the heart is dealing with the oxygenated blood. So it must be getting this blood from the lungs and then pumping it out to the rest of the body. The right side of the heart deals with the deoxygenated blood. So it must be getting this blood from the body and pumping it to the lungs. So we often refer to the right side of the heart as in charge of our pulmonary circuit, sending blood to the lungs and bringing it back. The left side of the heart is dealing with our systemic circuit, which is pumping oxygenated blood throughout the body and then bringing it back. So let's take a look at the four chambers. The atria represent the two chambers that receive blood. An atrium is a room that receives people. If you think about a building, when you walk into a building, you often walk into the atrium. You enter the atrium. Same is true for the heart. Blood enters the heart by going into either the right atrium or the left atrium. The atria are positioned superiorly when compared to the ventricles, so they're located above the ventricles. The right atrium receives blood from throughout the body. This blood already delivered oxygen to cells of the body, so it is deoxygenated blood. You'll notice there's a large blood vessel bringing blood down from the head and neck regions. That's called the superior vena cava. There's blood coming up to the right atrium from organs and tissues below the heart. That's called the inferior vena cava. There's a third blood vessel that you cannot see called the coronary sinus. That's bringing your coronary blood back into the heart, and we'll talk more about that later on. So this blood is all deoxygenated, and it's entering that right atrium. The left atrium receives oxygenated blood, and that blood picked up the oxygen at the lungs. So blood coming from the lungs into the left atrium is found within four pulmonary veins. You see, you can see one located here, here, and then there's two over here coming from the other side. So there's a lung on each side of the heart. So each lung, right and left, is bringing its blood towards the left atrium within these four pulmonary veins. This is a good place to learn what a vein is. A vein, by definition, brings blood towards the heart. So it's all about the direction the blood is moving. If it's going towards the heart, it's a vein. So these pulmonary blood vessels are veins. Blood's going towards the heart, towards the left atrium. These, the two vena cava, superior, inferior, and coronary sinus, are all veins because the blood is going towards the heart. It's entering the right atrium. Arteries move blood away from the heart. So if you're going away from the heart, you're an artery. If you're going towards the heart, you're a vein. It has nothing to do with what color they are or what kind of blood it is. It's about the direction the blood is flowing. When blood enters the atria simultaneously, it needs to then go down to the ventricles in order to be pumped out of the heart. So blood from the right atrium goes down to the right ventricle. Blood from the left atrium goes down to the left ventricle. In between the atria 
and the ventricles, there are valves. And we're going to learn about these valves coming up. But there's a valve located here that's called the tricuspid valve. There's a valve located here called the bicuspid or mitral valve. Those valves need to be open, and they are open, to let the blood flow from the atrium down into the ventricle. Then they need to close because we don't want blood to go back up into the atrium. So those valves are like doorways that open but then close immediately to prevent backflow. So let's look at the ventricles. Ventricles are located inferior to the atria. They are the larger chambers because there's more muscle required because the blood is being pumped out of the heart. The right ventricle gets the deoxygenated blood from the right atrium. When the ventricles, are gonna, when the ventricles contract, this blood is going to then have to pass through a valve to enter the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk is an artery because the blood is leaving and going away from the heart. There's a valve to prevent backflow. That valve is known as the pulmonary, semilunar valve. So blood from the right ventricle goes through a valve to get to the pulmonary trunk. This pulmonary trunk is bringing blood out of the heart, so it's an artery. Then it needs to split into two arteries called pulmonary arteries because the blood it needs to go to the lungs to get oxygen. The left side, blood from the left atrium goes through the bicuspid valve, enters the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, when the heart pumps, it goes through a valve called the aortic semilunar valve to get into the aorta. The aorta is this large artery. So you got two arteries now. The pulmonary trunk is an artery and the aorta is an artery. From the aorta, blood gets disseminated throughout the body. And to do that, there are smaller arteries that come off of the aorta at different positions. Some of them come off this arch. So this is called the aortic arch because it arches and then goes down behind the heart. So blood going to your head and neck is going to go via these arteries here. Blood going to your abdomen needs to be in this descending aorta and then go out to the organs below the heart. So these are the four chambers. We need to know what kind of blood is in them. Is it oxygenated or deoxygenated? Obviously be able to identify them. Understand proper blood flow, atrium to ventricle, and position these valves properly. There's a dramatic difference between the right and left ventricle. This has to do with how far the blood needs to be pumped and how much pressure has to be developed in order to move that blood. So we have to again go back to the fact that the right side of the heart is sending blood to the lungs. The lungs are not very far from the heart. They're on each side of your heart. So the right ventricle does not have to move blood very far. That short distance means there's less opposition to blood flow. There's, we call that resistance. If there's less resistance, you don't need as much pressure to move blood to the lungs. So the right ventricle only needs to get up to about 25 millimeters mercury. Millimeters mercury is a unit of pressure. So to get up to 25 millimeters mercury, the right ventricle doesn't need as much muscle. So if you compare the outer walls here, this is the outer wall of the right ventricle. It's much thinner than the wall of the left ventricle. So what we were looking at here is a transverse plane through the heart. We're looking up. We're looking up at the right 
ventricle, and we're looking up at the left ventricle. Same volume, even though it doesn't quite look like the same volume, but it's the same volume on each side. The big difference is the pressure necessary to move that blood. The left ventricle has to pump blood everywhere. We call that systemic. It has to pump blood up to your brain. It has to pump blood down your arms. It has to pump blood down your into your abdomen and down your legs. So it's a much longer distance that blood travels. When blood has to move longer distances, there's more resistance to that blood flow. To overcome that resistance, the left ventricle has to generate much more pressure. Uh, an average pressure is about 120 millimeters mercury when that left ventricle is contracting. That's the proper pressure necessary to move blood throughout the systemic circuit. This is also why most of your heart is positioned in the, on the left because of this large muscle of the left ventricle. They share this this central division here called the interventricular septum. Inter means between. Uh, the septum is a divider, so this is the divider between the left and right ventricle. So much more muscle on the left than there is on the right. Let's add the valves in again. We have the tricuspid valve and the bicuspid valve. These are collectively known as your atrioventricular valves because they are positioned between atria and ventricles. Tricuspid valve opens when pressure in the right ventricle drops below pressure in the right atrium. So what that means is the only way to have this valve open is to have a pressure difference, a higher pressure in the atrium compared to a lower pressure in the ventricle. Same is true for the bicuspid. These two valves are only going to be open if you keep the pressure in the ventricle low and blood will flow into that ventricle. When the valves close, they close simultaneously and that produces a sound. So when the ventricles contract and move blood out, these valves close because you don't want to move blood back into the atrium. So closing of these, these atrioventricular valves produces a sound. We call it S1, or it's the, the lub sound. If you think of your heart sound as being a lub-dub, that first lub sound is closing of the tricuspid and bicuspid valve simultaneously. The dub, the second heart sound, is due to closing of the semilunar valves, the pulmonary and aortic valve. These valves are named based on where that blood's going. If it's going pulmonary, it has to go through the pulmonary valve. If it's going to the aorta, it needs to go through the aortic valve. How do these open? Well, these open when the pressure in the ventricle exceeds the pressure on the other side of the valve and that opens those valves. They close when the pressure in the ventricle drops below the pressure on the other side of the valve and that valve closes. And that produces the S2 heart sound, the dub after the lub. I forgot to mention why the tricuspid is named tricuspid and why the bicuspid is named bicuspid. It has to do with how many flaps they have, how many cusps. The tricuspid has three little flaps to it. Very difficult to notice on this picture. We'll look at a better one. Bicuspid has two flaps. Bicuspid is also known as the mitral valve. And mitral refers to the resemblance to a mitre's hat. A mitre's hat is a hat in the Catholic Church. So if you Google a priest or the Pope, and look at their hat. Their hat has two flaps to it. And I'm assuming whoever named this valve the mitral valve was a Catholic. Uh, and the valve resembled uh, one of these 
these, these hats that they wear in the Catholic Church. So these are the four valves. These are pictures of those same valves, but looking at it, them a little differently. Notice we're now looking at a transverse plane through all four valves. This is a really good picture to be familiar with, but you have to look at and understand what you're looking at. This is the back of the heart, that's posterior. This is the front of the heart, that's anterior. Positioned more towards the back are the two atrioventricular valves. Notice this is the left side, this is the right side. So this is the tricuspid, there are the three flaps. Here's the bicuspid, there's the two flaps. These are the two semilunar, now you look at these flaps, they're both tricuspid valves, but we don't call them the tricuspid valve. We call them semilunar based on the resemblance of these cusps to a half moon. So someone thought these looked like the shape of a half moon, semilunar. This one, more anterior, is the pulmonary valve. Positioned behind it is the aortic valve. Very interesting, these two arteries coming off just above the aortic valve are your two coronary arteries. Coronary arteries supply the heart muscle with blood, which is extremely important. That heart muscle needs a lot of oxygen and nutrients to keep pumping. So the heart needs to get these blood vessels immediately to enrich the heart muscle with oxygen and nutrients. And these are the arteries you definitely don't want to clog with atherosclerosis or a blood clot because that would cause a heart attack or death of the muscle. So this is when all these valves are in the closed position. There is a small moment in time where all your valves are closed. This allows pressure to generate inside of the ventricle. So pressure builds and builds and builds and then that opens the semilunar valves. So now if we remember this picture and compare it to these two pictures, we have valves open. In this one we have blood entering the ventricles. So keep in mind the atria are removed. There's no atria. We cut them off. We're, the, we're looking from the atria, down at the heart. And blood is flowing down into the ventricles when these AV valves, atrioventricular valves, are open. When these two are open, the semilunars are closed because you don't want blood to enter the ventricle then leak out the ventricles. So in this position, blood is entering the ventricles, filling the ventricles. Then when the ventricles are ready to pump that blood out, the AV valves are going to close. There'll be a short moment in time where everyone's closed. Then the semilunar valves open and blood flows up and out of the ventricles through the pulmonary and aortic valves. So this picture is a snapshot when blood is being pumped out of the ventricles. So these are very useful drawings, very clear as far as the location of the valves and what they look like open and closed. This is an actual cadaver heart and you can see again here the valves might not look perfect because it's a cadaver, it's not a drawing, but you can locate the tricuspid, the bicuspid, the aortic, and the semilunar valves. So spend some time looking at these pictures. Um, they'll give you a better understanding of these valves, um, their locations, and what they look like when blood is flowing through the heart. There's a few accessory structures to think about when you study valves. Uh, the AV valves need to be stabilized with some structures. Uh, the, the AV valves have little tendons called chordae tendini or tendini. And those little cord-like tendons are attached to little tiny muscles within the ventricle. These little muscles 
are called papillary muscles. They're small cone-shaped muscles. When the heart contracts, that pressure generated in the ventricles really pushes up on these valves. And you really do not want those valves to prolapse. So prolapse is when the flaps, the cusps, get pushed up into the atria. That is not a good situation because then blood leaks back up into the atria. So these little papillary muscles contract and hold on tight to those valves. And that prevents what we call prolapse. Prolapse is most commonly seen with the mitral valve because there's a lot of pressure in that left side. So the papillary muscles attached to the uh, cusps with chordae tendini prevent mitral valve prolapse. It also prevents tricuspid valve prolapse. Other things that can happen to valves, stenosis, which is when a valve is too narrow and it can restrict blood flow through it. Um, you can repair that surgically. You can kind of stretch that valve open with a balloon called balloon valvuloplasty. You can completely replace the valve. There's also a situation where the valves are in, incompetent or insufficient. That's where they don't close all the way. And that's not a great situation either. That disrupts blood flow. So we've probably heard of valve replacements and, and things like that. And that's all based on how severe the, the disorder uh, or, the, or the defect in the valve is. The next video we're going to add now blood flow through the heart.